Namaste. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of S. Jaipal Reddy Memorial Foundation, I warmly welcome our chief guests, distinguished speakers, and all the participants for the national webinar celebrating democracy on the occasion of International Day of Democracy and 75th anniversary of Indian independence. The webinar was initially planned for the 15th of September to observe the International Day of Democracy, but we postponed it due to, to 18th Sunday to make it convenient for everyone to attend. Before we move to the speakers, I would like to briefly introduce Mr. S. Jaipal Reddy. A noted journalist wrote that Mr. Reddy was a synonym for courage and commitment. Once decided, he never used to rest till he achieved that goal. Apparently, for the same reason, he was elected as a member of Lok Sabha for four terms, Rajya Sabha for two terms, and Legislative Assembly for three terms. He is the recipient of the Outstanding Parliamentarian Award in 1998, the first South Indian and youngest Indian to be so honoured. He is also the recipient of Capital Foundation Award for the year 2013 in recognition for his outstanding contribution to science, technology, and public service. He was a man of principles and ideals. He sacrificed several posts on moral grounds and always followed a no-compromise attitude towards irregularities. He never minced words opinion. In one of the interviews, he said, political corruption is the mother of all corruptions, and if it is not addressed pro properly, it will destroy the very existence of democracy in our country. Mr. Jaipal Reddy, in his book, Ten Ideologies, the great asymmetry between agrarianism and industrialism wrote, I quote him, Despite repeated and continual setbacks in various parts of the world, democracy continues to have an undiminished appeal for people. Its popularity compels all sorts of rulers to promise electoral democracy. It is true that elections, when held, are often rigged and people are swayed through diversionary ethnic slogans. But democracy as a political system is universally acknowledged. Economic change and mass literacy, despite their slow and uneven growth rates, are bound to engender pressure for democracy. I end the quote. With this brief intro, I now move to the topic celebrating democracy. One of the most remarkable developments of the late 20th century has been the number of countries that have made the transition from authoritarian to democratic rule. This development has in turn produced an empirically and theoretically rich literature on democratic transitions and consolidation. The general picture of Indian democracy stands as a reminder that there's no linear progression to democracy. Much as the robustness of India's democratic institutions has been rightfully celebrated, the effectiveness of those institutions is increasingly questioned too. 75 years of almost uninterrupted democratic rule raises the question as political, social, and economic marginalization reduced. India's post-transition history has produced multiple trajectories of democratization. In order to understand the conditions under which democracy can be deepened, we need to develop accounts of democratization that explore the dynamic interactions between institutions and social processes. In this context, today for the national webinar on celebrating democracy, we have with us Honorable Sri Justice Jasti Chalmeshwar as the chief guest. He was a former judge in Supreme Court of India. Along with him, we have distinguished guest Dr. C. Raj Kumar, Professor and Vice Chancellor OP Jindal Global University, and Sri Shri Ram Kari. He completed his graduation in arts from the BVK Degree College in Vishakhapatnam, Andhra Pradesh. He was a member of Young Orators Club, Sikindrabad. Starting his career as a journalist, he worked with the Indian Express, the business publication division of the Indian Express Group, and the Deccan Chronicle. He has been a columnist for the Hindu and wrote a fortnightly column, Sedition and Perdition, for the New Indian Express. He has contributed to the Comment is Free section of The Guardian and currently writes for India Inc. blog at the New York Times. He is an English language novelist, writer, and columnist. His novel, The Autobiography of a Mad Nation, was long listed for the Man Asian Literary Prize in 2009. His first book, The Spiritual Supermarket, was published by Mosaic Books for the Indian subcontinent in 2007. It was long listed for the Odafone Crossword Book Award nonfiction category in 2008. I now invite Sriram Karigaru to address us. Welcome, sir. 
thank you uh, so much, uh, Shripa Krishna Vaibhav. I'm very grateful to the uh, S. J. Pal uh, Reddy Memorial Foundation for this opportunity to uh, be part of this gathering. Uh, I feel a little bit like a batsman who would walk into bat, knowing that Rohit Sharma and Virat Kohli will follow after. So with Professor Raj Kumar and Justice Chalmeshwar coming behind in the order, in the truly uh, makes me nervous. The theme uh, celebrating democracy. Now, any one of you who's part of this interaction virtually from any part of the world would uh, possibly more likely than not be logging in from some kind of a democratic context. We sent you an invitation saying, you know, some people will meet up on Zoom. They'll talk about democracy. Would you like to join in? And somewhere you voted with your sense of empowerment or the ability to make a decision saying, well, I would like to be part of this conversation. And you logged in. It seems so easy, so normal, so natural that you be empowered so. Human history, its study will tell you, it took centuries and centuries of struggle by millions of people denied that opportunity that you have today. To just log in using your phone, to listen to some people talk, ask them a few questions, looks like the most simplest of, normalist of realities of ours, yet, it comes after a very, very long struggle. And the struggle was very simply this. Of all the possible ways in which you can word, put words and phrases together, nothing hurts, nothing hurts those in power as much as everyone is equal or everyone should be treated equal. They have been people who have shaped human history for 5,000 plus years, who hated the very notion of this. And therefore, from the first tribe that was possibly created as humans moved from being food hunters and gatherers to agriculturists, they settled down. The first tribe, you had to create a tribe to protect yourself from Wild animals, you just discovered fire some time ago and now you growing food. You have to save the tribe and therein was created this belief that one, you are weaker, more inferior. You are a means for the survival and thriving of the tribe. The tribe should be led by somebody, appointed by God or is otherwise proven so superior. And from there on, inequality. The notion that people are different and some set of people deserve something more, an absolute whimsical power, so that the collective may survive, has largely led mankind's history. The notion, as Shilpa referred to, about two centuries, less than three centuries old, in a complete sense of a social contract refuting the divine rights theory that every single one here is equal. In any sense should be treated equal by a context of a legal system and to create social systems in which this legal system will get institutionalized, culturally internalized, individually internalized was the dream of democracy. Now, how democratic are we as a country? How far has democracy come? What are the flaws of democracy? What are the threats to democracy? These are themes on which for the last 250 years, the best of minds of humanity have been engaged on. One, for any country to be able to give to its citizens a fair sense of liberty, freedom, sense of equality, rule of law, strong democratic institutions. It itself has to be sovereign. So democratic lovers of democracy worldwide would also have 
to upfront at a macro level keep an eye on the global order you cannot have enslaved nations keeping their citizens free in turn consider the case of ukraine for example so a reasonably robust free democratically managed world order is significant second how democratic is each country which is a democracy and what do we do with countries that are by definition not democracies or uh, these are themes on which i'm sure the next two speakers will expound on speak a lot analyze i would like to give you a very micro individual perspective i look around and ask myself what are the most undemocratic contexts i run into not as a journalist i will not speak about the political class the bureaucracy the judiciary here yeah, as such but of how democratic are you and i how democratic are those little institutions on which you and i have a much greater say how democratized are our households now two institutions that i find particularly dictatorial in indian society one is the building apartment complex in every city you know every building apartment will have 100 flats 200 flats 500 flats there'll be a society running it i find them to be big threats to democratic thinking nobody really is ex- shocked any longer by the reality that if you belong to a certain religion you can't buy a flat in certain buildings across this country it's a very simple reality at the same time this is a reality in which common people like you and me have an extraordinary say there is no larger intervention there of an assembly a parliament a bureaucratic order a judicial order etc it is just 100 200 500 or common people living in a secular democratic context in modern day 2022 who in the one institution they get to run run it very dictatorial what kind of lifts are reserved for only the residents where do maids and drivers are allowed to take a lift this is the kind of undemocratic system that gets normalized in a very common microscopic order and then we are surprised that the aggregate order of millions of such apartments is not as democratic as we feel we deserve or we demand second we talk about the freedom of speech we talk about the freedom of uh, individuals we talk about the conflict of a uh, sense of social order being maintained by this country in the very difficult times when we became free post world war 1947 partition a constitution was given and then from there the last 75 years what kind of a track record we've had as a country well very simple look around yourself again and check the whatsapp groups you are part of just the whatsapp groups your family whatsapp groups your school friends whatsapp groups dictatorial autocrat if you want to understand the definition of fascism look at the admins behavior in your friends whatsapp group these are the contexts that i find more frightening than the systematic arm twisting of the fourth estate and reducing it to a nothing i find it more frightening than any threat coming at a higher level because this is where the normalization happens i truly believe i truly believe in a system which is however half big democracy it will be impossible for a dictatorial imposition unless that behavior is pre normalized by common people there has to be a prior justification in other words and i'm asking you this question on behalf of those millions of people who fought living in dictatorial autocratic monarchical systems and dreamt of a democracy some day where you and i can be as free as we are we owe an answer to them will we cherish this gift we have got 
or will we squander and surrender it? Yesterday was September 17th and I had an interaction with somebody who's a grandson of a Nizam or great grandson of the Nizam. And uh, we had a little discussion on WhatsApp and I felt an angst he expressed unwittingly saying if not for Sardar Patel and that action, I would have been the Nizam and you would have been a slave. It came very strongly from me. Look how you're talking to me. And I realized you and I are lucky. We're born in a system where nobody can consider us a slave by definition, not by de jure definition at least. The question is, do we care about it? Do you care about the fact that the most powerful person in this country can be made to be equal to you by a rule of law? That framework exists and you only have to stand for it. You only have to ensure that you do not give it away. So essentially what I would like to ask you is this. Leave the macro debate for a, si for a second and ask yourself, where you have influence, are you democratic? And as you walk every minute of your life, as you do every interaction at a very, very normal level at your airport security, at your uh, taxi or uh, getting into a taxi, at your office, in the lift, at the supermarket, are you standing up for these three simple things? If you run into somebody who's more powerful and would like to tell you you are inferior by definition, by stature, you do not deserve the equality. Do you have it in you to muster up the courage to ask them a question or to just ask a question? Second, if you find within your sight a system that is being unfair to somebody else, somebody weaker than you, are you able to stand up for them? That little change you will make. That very little change. And third, as you go about it, are you able to constantly realize and assert the rights that are given to you? The rights by which, in some sense, you are not a slave. Do we care enough? And that's all I believe it is. So whether India will be a greater democracy or a lesser democracy tomorrow will depend on how you and I behave. Do you assert, take the responsibility to be a more democratic individual or not? Don't forget, the only difference between democracy and rest of all those isms, monarchy, military dictatorship, theocracy, political dictatorship, and so on and so forth, and democracies partly under siege is that Systems would like to reduce you to a means, to a nothing, to an inconsequential entity. Do you going about your daily life with all its limitations, have it in you to realize, just like the best of religion was a case of man designing a god in his own image, democracy was a government design. With the citizen as its primary iota, its image. So in other words, are you sub-sovereign? Are you yourself sovereign enough, an entity that nobody can write off your rights? And anybody who challenges your rights or the challenges the rights of other people, erades them, degrades them. All it will take to reassert is to realize it and start the fight back with something as simple as raising a question. And I believe, therefore, this is not a battle of one hegemonic fascist party come to overtake the entirety of India. No, it is a billion such interactions and clashes. Democracy could lose at every micro transaction. All you have to do to save democracy is to understand it, is to be a little more democratic yourself. Listen to people who you disagree with. Fight for the rights of people you hate. When facing with authority, refuse to be subordinate. Next time you meet an IS officer, don't call them sir. Just call them Mr. or Mess and their last name and see what happens. Start challenging authority. Viscerally hate the idea that you are inferior to anybody and anything. 
it will make you a little unpopular it will make you a little less e- easy to get things done but it will make the air around you freer that's how democracy smells like thank you thank you sir um thank you sir for raising the issue of power and how collective can survive the struggles that is important for where we are today the social contract of rousseau how democratic is the countries that celebrate democracy or claim democracy how democratized are we the undemocratic systems that gets normalized at a micro level which actually reflects the macro mindset the threats that you mentioned in the micro which is a major concern that we all need to ponder upon uh, do we surrender or do we fight back to withhold the struggles of our previous generations do we stand up for others what's our role or how accountable we are how do we handle authority can we even challenge or even afford to challenge which that you have raised but i think we need to ponder upon these and now we move to the uh, thanks for the wonderful words we now move to our next speaker dr c rajkumar is a rhodes scholar and the founding vice chancellor of op jindal global university in india he was appointed as the vice chancellor at the age of 34 in 2009 when the university was established professor kumar as academic qualifications from the university of oxford harvard university university of hong kong university of delhi and loyola college professor kumar conceived the idea of establishing india's first global university and with the visionary leadership and philanthropic support of mr navin jindal established jindal global university in sonipat haryana in 2009 jindal global university is one of the only 20 universities in india and the only non stem and non medicine university which has been declared as an institution of eminence by the government of india professor kumar is an accomplished legal scholar and worked in the field of human rights and development comparative constitutional law terrorism and national security corruption and governance law and disaster management legal education and higher education he has over 200 publications to his credit and has published widely in australia india hong kong uk and usa i warmly welcome and invite professor rajkumar ji to address us uh thank you very much uh, shilpa uh, first of all i would like to extend uh, uh, my heartiest um, congratulations and indeed deep appreciation to the s j paul reddy memorial foundation and mr arvind reddy for uh, inviting me to this uh, very solemn occasion where we are doing uh, several things but also paying rich tribute to the life and contribution of uh, one of india's uh, Uh, tall uh, leaders a uh, truly remarkable statesman a politician with a, a deep sense of commitment and dedication to nation building and somebody who lived his life with the highest degree of integrity and uh, rectitude and deep sense of conviction so i want to pay that tribute as i begin some of my reflections we also of course celebrating uh, democracy but also recognizing the international day of democracy and also 70th year of indian independence i am also uh, truly delighted to see uh, honorable mr justice uh, chelameshwar former judge of supreme court of india uh, another extraordinary jurist uh, whose contribution both uh, in the court and outside the court uh, gave lot of inspiration for all of us uh, in the efforts to build a society based on the rule of law i'm also grateful to see uh, sri ram kari for his uh, absolutely thought provoking and truly remarkable set of reflection right. just now sri ram told us stop these uh, these prefixes and suffixes honorable justice is not anyway that's, that's okay sir you know what i'm saying well the way i see this is there are some who genuinely deserve that prefixes so <laughs> i'll leave it at that <laughs> <laughs> all right um, uh, so uh, i just want to say that uh, Uh, this uh, topic and theme that we are discussing today about uh, the future of democracy is a timely one uh, let me begin by saying uh, uh, you know referring you to a very important uh, contemporary report uh, published by the uh, by the uh, economist magazine and this is the, they published this as an annual effort and as they also produce what is known as the democracy index 2021 although most of what i'm going to speak will be in relation to india 
this uh, report published by uh, Economist uh, talks about, and I quote, according to this measure of democracy, and I'm going to quickly cite this, but before I do that, uh, their democracy index is based upon five categories. One is electoral process and pluralism. Number two, functioning of government. Number three, political participation. Number four, political culture. And number five, civil liberty. So these, this is the methodology they adopt. And they've been doing this since 2006. And the 2021 Democracy Index has been published recently. And in that report, they say, and I quote, uh, according to our measure of democracy, less than half of the world's population now live in a democracy of some sort. A significant decline from even 2020, even fewer reside in a full democracy. Uh, that's around 6.4%. This level is down from 8.4% in 2020 after two countries, Chile and Spain, but downgraded to flawed democracies. Substantially more than a third of the world's population, over 37% live under authoritarian rule, with a larger share being in China. Now, in the 2021 Democracy Index, 74 of the 167 countries and territories covered by the model, or say 44.3% of the total, are considered to be democracies. Now, the number of full democracies fell to 21 in 2021, down from 23 in 2000. The number of flawed democracies increased by 1 to 53. Of the remaining 93 countries in, in this index, 59 are quote-unquote authoritarian regimes, up from 57 in 2020, and 34, 34 are classified as hybrid regimes, down from 35 in 2020. I'm going to put the in the chat the link to the report, but that's kind of a big picture situation with regard to the state of democracies around the world. With that prefix, I want to say that uh, uh, it was truly really remarkable that in 1947, uh, the founding uh, individuals of the Indian Republic set out the creation of a newly independent nation on with a view to or a vision to build a liberal, democratic, uh, secular polity and country. And uh, now there were several predictions at that time uh, that absolutely got it wrong. Uh, people were uh, predicting the imminent fall of Indian democracy. Uh, they were uh, saying, arguing that this was too big, too diverse, too complex, uh, too diverse, and too much of uh, religion and caste and all of that, including poverty, which will lead to its imminent fall. And uh, of course, all of them were wrong. And now since that time, uh, we've had a lot of evolution in the country and we'll quickly run through it. But uh, one thing is certain, that in 75 years, India has truly emerged as a federalist, pluralist, liberal and democratic nation that has been built on robust foundations uh, with regard to uh, co uh, protecting the constitutional order uh, as well as an efforts to establish a society based on the rule of law, all of which I believe are under stress. Now, let me quickly uh, make the first argument that um, uh, the constitution uh, that the founders had uh, created uh, pretty much laid the uh, foundations of the Indian Republic. The post-independent story in India is one of social transformation, political enlightenment, enlightenment economic prosperity, civic empowerment, and even cultural awakening. This is India. This is indeed the idea of India uh, that uh, constantly inspires us to do more in many ways, investing in human progress, conscious growth, and inclusive development. Now, at the heart of this lies the Constitution of India, where rights and duties and the rules of governance are enshrined. And despite significant challenges in the constitutional uh, the constitutionalism uh, efforts to implement constitutionalism in India has uh, been the case. Uh, India did, uh, you know, withstand the test of time to become a role model of democracy and grew from strength to strength, especially when you look around, even in this region, the stress and the downfall of other democracies uh, is a telling tale. Now, the constitution became the supreme law of the country. Uh, in 1950, a watershed moment in India's history. Uh, this is a significant milestone as the Constitution of India replaced the Government of India Act in 1935, the governing document of India on 26 January 1950. 
Now, this uh, is also a very profound development because it underscores the founding vision of our democracy and the attachment that was given to the principles of the rule of law and values of constitutionalism. This, of course, becomes even more important because of the fact that at that time, India was filled with a large number of illiterate people. The decision to adopt the universal adult franchise uh, at a time even when countries in Europe, such as uh, uh, Switzerland, ended up giving right to vote for women only in the late 60s and early 70s, India decided to do that just at our independence. And that was an extraordinary commitment towards the idea of democracy. Now, I do believe that constitutions at their best may provide the political and institutional venue for promoting a rights discourse. They are also written at a time when momentous political changes take place in a country and the framers uh, simply objectively attempt to transform the society. And that's exactly what the framers of the Indian constitution did. Now, constitutional guarantees uh, cannot ensure human rights are protected unless they succeeded in engaging the democratic process in society, an empowering function that ought to become the goal of constitutionalism. So it is important that there are independent democratic institutions that function effectively in ensuring that the governance system adheres to the principles of the rule of law and the constitution. I do believe that constitutionalism should be understood to encompass all such institutions. It is a principle that encompasses a variety of political theory ideals, demonstrating a framework of governance that is based upon human rights, fundamental freedoms, and human dignity. Now, constitutionalization of human rights uh, creates a theoretical framework for the protection and from it flow the various legal, judicial, democratic, and institutional mechanisms that ensure it. The judiciary is able to best perform its constitutional functions only when the independence of other democratic institutions is guaranteed and the government addressed to certain principles of constitutional governance. Human rights and fundamental freedoms are too important for the judiciary to be their exclusive guardian and most liberal constitutions do not envision that. Let me move to the next big idea in 1947 and how we have grown, which is about the need for having a pragmatic relationship with our neighbors, but also having a foreign policy with a scientific bent of mind. Our foreign policy was always rooted in realism and pragmatism. And this particularly helped India navigate the often complex international relations aptly during the Cold War era and protected it from being another theater of superpower competition that devastated many nations, either by civil strife and dictatorships, military or civilian, or by both. Today, as we've entered the third decade of the 20th century, another superpower competition is looming large, but India has now become an influential power on the global stage alone, and hence cannot be ignored. By the end of the decade, India is projected to be the world's third economy from the fifth position it is now. India's democratic ethos were accompanied by a scientific bent of mind that helped the country invest heavily in agriculture, heavy industry, science and technology, R&D, and all of which have reaped the benefits. Today, we are indeed a frontline nation in agriculture, science, technology, and innovation. In fact, recently I was talking to a, a, a bunch of students in the United States, and I did tell them that the cost of uh, the India's leadership in promoting frugal innovation in science and technology is extraordinary. Uh, the contribution of Indian scientists, uh, even before the independence, uh, people like Homi Baba and uh, Vikram Sarabhai and later Dr. Abdul Kalam and, of course, C.V. Raman, all these individuals had the vision to uh, elevate Indian science and, and benchmark it with the world's best. And today we have culminated in a situation where uh, India's successful Mars mission, the cost of which was much less than the cost of the Hollywood movie Gravity. Such is the power of Indian science and technology and its contribution towards benchmarking excellence for the world. So the 75 years of Indian democracy that we celebrate today witnessed the country's great strides in legal and policy mechanisms to attain different types of uh, achievement, including development. It also promoted meaningful social security programs to assure the dignity of life 
defined excellence in science and technology, and also made steady progress in healthcare, education, entertainment, sports, heavy industries, and so much more. At the dawn of independence, India had 20 universities, and today over, we have over 1,000 universities. Our ability to make a difference in promoting education and contributing to the development of nation has been quite significant. The, uh, the democratic decentralization process in the form of establishing Panchayati Raj institutions and Nagar Palikras have also made deeper democratic decision making possible and economic liberalization has also lifted millions of Indians out of poverty. The life expectancy at the time of Indian independence was around 37 and now it's nearly double that at over 70 years of age. These are significant achievements that Indian democracy has seen in the last 75 years. Now, what are the challenges that we face today? While we look, while we look back at our founding and the journey we have traveled in these 75 years, it is important for us to acknowledge the significant challenges that we are facing today as a society. Among all the challenges that we are facing today, I believe the most important of these challenges in our society is our relative indifference to ensure our, our commitment to the values of constitutionalism and the rule of law. I'm not saying this because I'm a law professor or somebody trained in law. I genuinely believe that the significant challenge that India will continue to face in the future is our, our efforts to build a society based on the rule of law and our deeper civic society, civil society's conscious commitment to protecting the values of constitutionalism. Let me take you back to Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, the chairman of the drafting committee of the Constitutional Assembly, who was deeply appreciative of the challenge and warned against these threats in his last speech delivered at the Constitutional Assembly on November 25, 1949, a day before the Constitution of India was adopted. And he famously gave three warnings. Let me begin by quoting him. If we wish to maintain democracy, not merely in form, but also in fact, what must we do? The first thing in my judgment we must do is to hold fast to constitutional methods of achieving our social and economic objectives. It means we must abandon the bloody methods of revolution. It means that we must abandon the method of civil disobedience, non-cooperation and satyagraha. When there are no way left for constitutional methods for achieving economic and social objectives, there was a great deal of justification for unconstitutional methods. But where constitutional methods were open, there can be no justification for these unconstitutional methods. These methods are nothing but the grammar of anarchy, and the sooner they are abandoned, the better for us. Unquote. The second thing he observed that we must do is to recognize the need for maintenance of democracy, namely not to lay their liberties at the feet of even a great man or to trust him with power which enable him to subvert the institutions. This is John Stuart Mill's famous warning. There is nothing wrong in being grateful to great men who have rendered lifelong services to the country, but there are limits to gratitude as well. He was conscious about the potential threats of hero worship and how no democracy can accept any form of hero worship. The third thing that he argued is that we must do is to not to content with mere political democracy. He, he exhorted us to think about social democracy and political democracy, he believed, cannot last unless there lies at the base of its the social democracy. So these are three warnings, the need to avoid hero worship, need to give up the grammar of anarchy, and need to work towards a social and not just a political democracy. These are unfinished tasks that are before us, and we need to work towards it. Let me quickly summarize some of the current threats to democracy. First, the dysfunctioning of democratic institutions. There are several curbs on free press, the occasional challenges uh, that are imposed in the functioning of the parliament itself, the politicization of the civil services, and even arguably the politicization of criminal justice system, all of which are unfortunately affecting the independence of institutions. Second, and I'll deal with, deal with a little bit elaborately, corruption and inefficiency. Rampant corruption, red tapism, delays in delivery of justice are also weakening the foundations of democracy. Anti-social elements. Uh, you may recall that uh, over three decades ago, there was an important report known as the uh, Vora Committee Report that talks about 
criminalization of politics and politicization of crime. Some of those elements are continuing to challenge us even today, and we need to address that. And part of it is about how we can improve the functioning of the criminal justice system and instill faith among ordinary people that the rule of law will prevail. Four, growing economic and social inequalities among people, poverty, healthcare, uh, issues surrounding literacy, population, unemployment are, pre are prevalent and hampering national progress. If there is one thing that we all witnessed during the COVID-19 crisis was the vulnerability and the risks associated with impoverishment that adversely and disproportionately affects the poor and no democracy can sustain if we have significant levels of inequalities and inequities deeply embedded in both the civic and political culture of a nation. Five issues surrounding discrimination. A lot has happened since our independence, but we have a long way to go. Past, gender, and religious discrimination continues to prevail in Indian society, slackening its advancement and development. Exploitation of caste and religious minorities for narrow political gains has unfortunately affected the concept of democracy. Six, influence of money and muscle in elections. While we have been able to uh, instill faith in the idea of democracy and while we've been able to conduct free and fair elections to a large extent, I do believe that use of money and muscle power during elections uh, reflect the challenge of Indian democracy as a whole and it continues to impact the electoral process itself. I want to briefly refer to the relationship between corruption and how it has acquired a greater threat to uh, Indian democracy. Let me begin by the famous observation of Navi Pillai, former United Nations High Commissioner of Human Rights. And uh, uh, when nobody, uh, this particular uh, you know, uh, set of words uh, in many ways defines the challenge of corruption and its impact on human rights and democracy. And this is our quote. Let us be clear, corruption kills. The money stolen through corruption every year is enough to feed the world's hungry 80 times over. Near, nearly a, a billion plus, and she says, 870 million people go to bed hungry every night. Corruption denies them their right to food and in some cases their right to life in human rights terms. It denies access to justice for victims. It exacerbates inequality, weakens governance and institutions, erodes public trust, fuels impunity, and undermines the rule of law, in particular, the right to a fair trial, the right to due process, and the victim's right to effective redress and court. Um, I have elsewhere written a lot about it, but all I would say here is that uh, corruption as a facet of uh, you know, uh, a country's uh, impact on human rights is, sin is serious, and we need to address that as well. So in conclusion, I would like to say that despite the many challenges our polity faces, we have reasons to be optimistic because as a nation, India has proved its skeptics wrong many times. Democracy does allow for course corrections. I would like to conclude by saying the challenges to the rule of law and democracy in India today are multifold and there is no single quick fix to overcome these challenges. The change needs to begin from the top if we are to emerge as a more democratic nation which abides by the rule of law. The formal mechanisms for the protection of rights through constitutional apparatus and their enforcement by the judiciary can fail, particularly when these oper institutions operate under limitations. More importantly, there is a need for people's resistance and movements to ensure the protection and promotion of, of rights. While a sound constitutional framework and independent judiciary and other democratic institutions are, can uphold the constitution of India, the principles of constitutionalism have not yet permeated our political culture. It is here that we have a long way to go in ensuring the human rights, justice, and constitutional empowerment become the sine qua non of democratic governance in India. There is no better way to end than citing the words of none other than the father of nation, Mahatma Gandhi. And I quote, I will give you a talisman whenever you are in doubt or when the self becomes too much with you apply the following test. Recall the face of the poorest and the weakest whom you have seen and ask yourself if the step you contemplate is going to be of any use to him or her. Will he or she gain anything by it? Will it restore him or her to a control over his or her own life and destiny? In other words, 
will it lead to Swaraj for the hungry and spiritually starving millions? Then will find you'll find your doubts and yourself melt away. Unquote. I would like to end by thanking uh, Ms. Arvind Reddy and the Jaipal Reddy Foundation for giving me this opportunity to share these reflections. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for bringing Dr. America when he said, there's nothing wrong in being grateful to great leaders who have rendered lifelong services to the country, but there are limits to gratitude. And he quotes Irish patriot Daniel O'Connell, no man can be grateful at the cost of his honor. No woman can be grateful at the cost of her chastity, and no nation can be grateful at the cost of its liberty. Dr. Ambedkar emphasized that this caution is far more necessary in the case of India than in the case of any other country. And as you took us back to the founding vision of democracy, we see nationalism is often said to be the crucible of modern democracy. Social awakening, inclusive development being the key. Thanks for informing us about the report by economist Magdalene Democracy Index 2021, which focused on electoral functioning, political participation, political culture, and civil liberties, statistics show that we have authoritarian regimes around the world. You brought in the fact and the need of the day that democratic institutions need to function effectively and independently. As we develop in science and technology as a nation and set new benchmarks, we also need to look whether these are accessible, affordable, and available to all the sections. That's vulnerability inequalities. Thereby, our efforts to build a society with protecting the values of constitutionalism. We now move on to the much awaited speaker, the chief guest for the occasion, Justice Sri Jasti Chalmeshwar Garu. He was born in Krishna district, Andhra Pradesh. After completing his schooling in Mashri Patnam, he enrolled at Loyola College, Chennai, and obtained a bachelor's degree in science with physics as his major subject. He then studied law and obtained an LLB from Andhra University, Vishakhapatnam, in 1976. He served as an additional judge at the then High Court of Andhra Pradesh. Later, he became the Chief Justice of Gawati High Court in 2007. He was later transformed as the Chief Justice of the Kerala High Court. He has done exemplary work on the green benches in both Guwahati and Kerala. He was later elevated as a judge, Supreme Court of India, in October 2011. He retired on 22nd June 2018 as the second most senior Supreme Court judge. He has delivered seven landmark judgments while in the top court. I now invite Justice Jasti Chalmeshwar Garu to address us. A warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you, Silpa. Good evening to you all. At the outset, I must uh, express my gratitude to Mr. Vindredi for conferring this honor on me to be the Chief Guest on this occasion of the 6th Mr. J. Paul Reddy Memorial Lecture. Well, I have a association with the late Mr. J. Paul Reddy, which, is, which defies definitions. I can't say he was my friend because we are not of the same age, we didn't go to the same school, we didn't go to the same college. Uh, well, uh, well, I didn't go to the parliament, he didn't come to the high court, but I had interaction with him. We have, we have common friends. Then, of course, uh, I was a little uh, active in politics for some time in my life, in the 80s. At that point of time, of course, politics, when I say, not electoral politics, I never contested an election, but then I was involved with a political party. In that context, uh, there were occasions when I met uh, late Mr. J. Paul Reddy. We had uh, pleasant uh, exchanges, exchange of ideas, exchange of uh, information. Well, it was a pleasant time. I remember him very fondly. And by the time I got to know him, he was a prominent man. By then he had contested again as Mrs. late Mrs. Gandhi, lost the election, who he lost the election. And that put him on the Indian uh, political map. He was too big a man by then, by the time I got to know him, when I was a nobody. No. 
it is a fitting uh, topic chosen by the organizers to commemorate uh, let me say apologies memory he was a democrat democrat in the real sense of it not uh, not in form but the content unfortunately we have come to a stage in this country that at least these are my personal views i may be wrong or the right but then any democrat should accept views even if they disagree and remember that famous statement i disagree with the not agree with the word of what you say but i should protect your right to say so so in that spirit if people take my what i'm going to say today see i believe we have we are at a stage in this country the political uh, uh, situation we i think are mistaking form for content mr rajkumar was uh, mentioning about uh, the survey conducted by the economist and then of course he gave the details and all and the basic uh factors in these indices which were chosen by them for determining the 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 vitality of democracies across the world well they are going by the text they are the right things the question is how uh, vibrant and uh, effective these factors are in in our country today when we are talking about celebrating democracy so let us talk about this country we can talk about the rest of the world later now i may put it in my own way as a student of constitutional law when i when somebody talks about democracy or when i talk about democracy i keep uh, the following factors in mind that there is a periodic election process to choose the representatives for making the laws second such chosen representatives make the laws which are rational and uh, consistent with certain core values and trend in a in the constitution which we adopted some 70 years back then that the authority of the state the jurisprudential state i'm not talking about the geographical state the authority of the state is divided between three organs of uh, the state machinery the law making institutions the law enforcing institutions and the adjudicatory bodies which under the indian constitutional scheme like many other uh, constitutional schemes uh is interested with the responsibility of uh, assessing the constitutionality of the laws made by the law making bodies now the other factor which is very relevant in making an assessment of the, the true nature of the democracy of a particular country at a particular point of time that these three organs of authority of the state perform their duties uninfluenced by the other two organs each one of these organs should function uninfluenced by the other organs of the state the fourth and most important all this arrangement is meant for the people of this country that the people enjoy under this system of democracy certain inalienable rights the purpose of power creating all these systems the purpose of running all these systems is to make sure ultimately people of the country enjoy those rights well 
these are my tests to determine whether it's this country or some other country whether there is a democracy and how healthy that democracy is now i always believed maybe wrongly sometimes but i believed that we indians secured uh, rather i don't know really i don't know what is the word that i should employ whether we secured it we got it or it was imposed on us got a fine western model of democracy and a predominantly feudal society by the time we adopted the constitution this was a predominantly feudal society 70 years later uh, it its uh, structure might have changed to some extent but it still continues to be a feudal society according to me the hierarchical systems uh without meaning any offense to anybody or uh, anything just to drive home the point to say it's a feudal system whenever we watch the swearing in ceremony of the cabinet of the tenile the state of the most of the honorable ministers quite a good number of them not all of them we have excellent some of them are excellent on this the first the first step public act is to dive at the feet of the leader i think there is a clear index of uh, the feudal systems now <laughs> we'll take it up later the point is if we examine these uh, various aspects which are mentioned as the, as the indices of democracy in this country are we to really celebrate or not is the question the second president of america john adams some context made a famous statement remember that a democracy never lasts long it soon wastes itself there wasn't a democracy which did not commit suicide he said but he was not a ordinary man but not because he was the president of america but he was a man who fought the war against the empire we had a great experience we had now there is an element of truth uh, a great deal of truth in this yes do we celebrate democracy today or am i am hope so that's going on in this country the first test is we do have periodic elections however flawed the electoral however flawed the electoral process is over uh, undesirable some of the practices which are adopted at the elections are we still have a regular electoral system this kind of periodic election to choose the representatives of the people we must really be happy about it we must celebrate that of course it, the process should be be more refined and more uh, uh, and and less unwholesome but, but that's a goal nothing is achieved uh, overnight it's an effort that should go on but all of us know if you want to make me make it more uh, specific a few years back while i was still in delhi there was some occasion like this uh, 150 people uh, we gathered there and each one of them was either holding a public office a very high public office in this country at that point of time or just laid down a very high public office sometime prior to that and a man incidentally has some connection with andhra pradesh mr brahma who was the former chief election commissioner of india who belonged to the ap the undivided ap card as officer he made a statement people spend 40 50 crores to get elected to the parliament he made a statement and it's a statement coming from uh, not a person on the street somebody who held a very very respond and very very relevant position in the context of elections 
then what happened there after I am not going into all those things. So therefore, the process is not a certainly very wholesome process, but the process is there. So let us not uh, confuse between the form and content. It, it should be better. But nonetheless, the, we are still retaining the form is something which should make us happy. We should make us celebrate and try to improve it. Then coming to the lawmaking process. Well, what is the level of debate that goes on in the lawmaking bodies regarding the... I'm not talking about the zero hours and questions and the mutual mudslinging by rival political... I'm not talking about it. I'm talking about the proper lawmaking process. What kind of debate that goes on while making the law? Voting, of course, is taken. Voting is done and then under the now the 10th schedule, if a member of a political party does not vote in accordance with the VP should, uh, you would face consequences. Therefore, voting is uh, always takes place. But what exactly is the nature of the debate? Ultimately, when we are talking about democracy, people, people, the representatives of the people, debate the the strengths and weaknesses of the proposal of the legislation, proposed legislation, and come to a conclusion in the interest of the people of the country. Though in this area, in my opinion, having my own experience and having watched the process, this lawmaking process, it uh, requires uh, much to be desired. It is not, the debate is not uh, really satisfactory most of the time. Then, the third aspect of the matter is whether the three organs of the constitutional machinery, the lawmaking bodies, the law enforcing uh, machinery and the adjudicatory bodies, how independent each one of these units are of the other two. Well, insofar as the lawmaking bodies are concerned, world of not only in this country, the advent of party politics made them less independent. The minute somebody gets elected to a lawmaking uh, body, as I told you, it's not peculiar to India, anywhere. The elected representative is bound by a certain uh, code of conduct of the organization which puts him in that body, which is the organization called party. So, first of all, that takes uh, some degree of the independence of the elected member. Not necessarily that uh, every member subscribes to the principle on the basis of which a particular legislation is being made. But then he is bound by the party discipline. That's one, one factor. It has its own flip side. Why, sh why it should be so? Why it uh, should, could not be otherwise? You know, we have seen a lot of problems there. Then, these uh, bodies, the lawmaking bodies in a party system like this, when, they, when there are periods of history where very strong personalities uh, occupy the, the top seat, most of the time they simply become uh, although the parliament in theory or the state legislature in theory is supposed to hold the executive answerable to, to every act the executive does that uh, authority is hardly ever exercised the minute the executive takes a decision and seeks to implement the decision in the name of the party discipline, uh, no, the, the necessarily the executive belongs to the majority party. Therefore, majority members don't raise the question. And of course, the, the members of the opposition raise questions, sometimes relevant, sometimes irrelevant questions. Uh, the basic uh, debate and uh, proper uh, logical analysis is missing. Coming to the the role of the law enforcing agencies, the so-called bureaucracy, that is, I heard a number of former civil servants, celebrated people who are 
is people with great uh, track record and reputation saying that the bureaucracy is much less independent than what it used to be in early years now coming to the judiciary well, i don't want to make any further statement today i put it in a controversy i leave it uh, to the gathering to make its own assessments about this matter uh, i'll come to the last uh, aspect that is the liberties of the people now there are many fundamental rights guaranteed under the constitution the right to association right to free movement so on and so forth. but the core is the freedom of speech and the liberty i think they are the core of these liberties the right not to be unduly restrained or simply put not to be imprisoned without following the irrational process of law and the and the right to speak freely these two liberties constitute the core of all liberties and any constitutional democratic government now i'm conscious of uh, that uh, famous chechelian statement that there is a great deal of free speech there is bound to be certain amount of free speech i'm conscious of it but toleration for that foolish speech is part of democracy question is when the speech becomes vicious it crosses the limit and then democracy itself is in danger i am afraid i think we are approaching that stage that debate in all public fora why public fora mr uh, shriram was talking about uh, the civil society whatsapp groups the kind of uh, debate that goes on in whatsapp groups well uh, is slowly turning vicious we are not debating issues we are debating personalities and their private lives even public sphere on questions of public matters now in anyway, question is even otherwise yes yesterday i was but uh, i participated in another event yesterday in this city a few prominent public men also participated in fact three of them are ministers of three different states one was a former union minister they all appeared in the newspapers i'm not mentioning the names and uh, and uh, another is a sitting member of the parliament was been a member of the parliament uh, for three or four terms or for what exactly how many terms it was there each one of them not all of them at one exception rest of them in the, the course of their uh, interaction in the program made a very apologetic uh, statement mind you there three of them are sitting ministers of different states and uh, one is a s- member of the parliament sitting member of the parliament at the preface their statement saying look, look here i am not anti national but then i have to say this if we have reached a stage in this country of a sitting member of a cabinet of a particular state or any state is to preface his statement make a declaration that he is not anti national i i don't know what is the quality of free speech we are enjoying today in this country now i am not blaming uh, a particular political party or uh, a particular individual or anybody but then this happened over a period of 75 years we were talk to that stage we have come to this in fact mr jawal reddy who is a few years older than me i think 6 7 years older than me i'm not very sure maybe 8 years all of us belong to that generation which went through the drill of the emergency when people were a little worried about uh, speaking politics uh, even in drawing rooms i remember as an youngster 1975 in this city i was in a private dinner i was an youngster a few elders were there uh, a few elders included a sitting mla of those days and a sitting judge of those days there was some discussion and then with all the exuberance of a youngster 
I made some statement. The other gentleman, of course, they were all personally related to me. The gentleman who was an MLA cautioned me, Hey, young fellow, you better be careful. Don't talk like this outside. I was a sitting MLA of the then ruling party. So this was the atmosphere of those days. Now, from drawing room in a public platform, sitting ministers are to prepare their uh, statements that they are not anti-national. This is something really painful. This is something really painful. And it doesn't uh, agar well for a democracy. Now, this is all the problems of in fact, my dear friend, Justice Sudarshan Reddy, must have logged in because he was one of the common friends. Because I was introduced to late Mr. Jaipal Reddy by him. He is logged in. And he, he, by political philosophy, he was a locate. I believe he told me, I, I, I never read this statement, he told me something. I believe Dr. Lohia frequently used to comment. Uh, that the English knowing gentlemen of this country are the problem of this country. So most of these problems which I have discussed are the problems of the English knowing gentlemen. Dr. Rajikumar, Sri Ram, and Chalameshwar and all these things. The real problem is the problem of the non-English speaking people of this country. What are they doing? From their point of view, how well this democracy is uh, serving them respect of the parties, which parties were in power in Delhi, Hyderabad, Vijayawada, I am not about that. Yes, from their point of view, as Rajkumar was pointing out in the last 70 years, with all the flaws which we have been discussing so far, thanks to great uh, technocrats, great scientists, men of great engineering skills, this country did it achieve uh, some degree of progress, as Rajkumar was mentioning. Well, there were 20 universities, those days there were 1,000 universities. I, all of us remember, I think more or less all of us belong to the same age group, if not the same age. When we were traveling by trains, and as students of the college, trains ran late, not by hours, sometimes even by days. Making a trunk call was a pain to a long distance call. Now we can talk to, well, anybody across the globe. That facility is available in this country, not only to the English knowing gentlemen, but even non-English speaking people. I, I, if I remember right, I, there are some uh, uh, 200 million mobile phones available in this country. That's what I read some time back. Maybe the number has gone up of late. A billion plus. A billion plus. A billion plus. A billion plus. Sir. Yeah. Now, uh, similarly, Education facilities, as Rajmar was pointing out, have increased. More number of people are getting educated. But the ultimate question is, is poverty and hunger wiped off from this country, and for democracy? The answer appears to be no. Still, a large number of people are uh, poverty-stricken. I know there is no magic by which anybody, any government, even if I, you, and I, Mr. Rajkumar, and Sri Ram become the prime ministers or rulers of this country, we can't do it overnight. I am conscious of the fact. But is the effort uh, going on in the right direction? What is the question? That's a, that's a matter which requires. And in making that assessment and making it possible, those who believe that they are Democrats, those who believe in democracy, do have a great role to play to ensure that the fruits of democracy, the ultimate uh, goal of uh, the constitution of democracy in this country, please remember, the Indian constitution enshrines certain principles of which the whole system is erected, the directive principles. The purpose of the whole system is to achieve that. The preamble says the purpose of the constitution is to secure justice, social, political, and economic. Now, if we are talking about democracy, and if we, we are uh, remembering Mr. Jaipal already, the greatest tribute we can pay to him is 
to incessantly work to make it possible that the goals and trend in the preamble of the constitution are achieved and the effort is continuously made and uh, with this i think i should uh, conclude thank you all thank you sir for sharing your association and interaction with jaipal reddy garu was a true democrat and raising the issues that we face today with reference to law making law enforcing and adjudicatory bodies and emphasizing the importance of them with that is operating independently with the required code of conduct to be followed the core topic that comes to everyone when we hear the freedom of speech is dissent how tolerant are we to dissent why does the state see dissent as a threat it is important to discuss democracy and dissent which is the need and the threat everyone is aware about with this we come to the last part of the webinar as jaipal reddy foundation express their sincere gratitude to the chief guest and distinguished speakers for agreeing to be part of this webinar i thank all the participants and viewers for taking time out and joining us virtually special thanks to professor pushottam reddy garu for your constant guidance thanks to shri dilip reddy garu for his valuable time and support as a closing remark or as a way forward i would like to mention a few points here It's important to examine the relationship between state and democracy in India. The real challenge for Indian democracy is the gap between democracy and legitimacy. In order to produce accountable institutions, the gap between legitimacy and accountability needs to be bridged. But this gap can be bridged only by taking into account the regulative ideal of politics citizens operate with. What are the set of expectations that citizens bring to politics and how do these expectations shape what democracy produces despite many imperfections democracy is a form of government that aspires to honor the standing of citizens as free and equal persons while there is a considerable debate over the degree to which democracy promotes or impedes growth there is less doubt that the democratic aspiration is itself a vital component of development recognizing the status of individuals as citizens rather than mere subjects expanding their rights and their freedoms to define their own lives protecting them from the exercise of arbitrary power and making government accountable through greater participation of the government are central components of the development aspiration itself representative constitutional democracies are a mode of organizing government through which these aspirations are recognized and it is also important to examine the degree to which inherited forms of social inequality cast a long shadow on democracies and distort its functioning social inequality may distort the functioning of democracy by redefining the very meaning of politics and society in such a way that politics of common citizenship becomes difficult to achieve therefore a citizen's obligation in a democracy is not discharged as told by the speakers by the exercise of franchise once in 5 years and thereafter retiring in passivity and not taking any interest in the working of the government and enforcing its accountability accountability is to be enforced not merely at the time of elections but during the life of the government in power otherwise democracy becomes merely a ritualistic exercise in voting and not a continuous process of government by the people an alert and active citizenry is essential to ensure the successful functioning of participatory democracy and making it a reality I would like to conclude the webinar by quoting a passage from the book Ten Ideologies: The Great Asymmetry Between Agrarianism and Industrialism, written by Jaipal Garu. He says, "It is seen time and again that democracy is not a sapling that can be transplanted on an ill-prepared soil. However, democratic struggles at the popular level can prepare the soil itself." Thank you all for attending. Happy evening. Thank you. Thank you.